This is Dr. Saad in front of you and today my topic is the esophageal perforation. It means that the perforation of esophagus in the upper part, in the middle part or in the lower part, you can say the cervical, thoracic or the abdominal parts of the esophagus, the perforation in those areas is called as the esophageal perforation. Now first of all, what, the, what are the causes of the esophageal perforation? So, first of all is the most common cause of the esophageal perforation is the iatrogenic cause. Iatrogenic cause means that it is due to the instrumentation. Basically what happens that it occurs this esophageal perforation it is the most common and it occurs during the certain procedures like if we are doing the GI endoscopy most commonly or we are doing certain other therapeutic or if we are doing the diagnostic procedures those procedures they can lead to the esophageal perforation in which the most common is the GI endoscopy so this is what this is the most common cause of the esophageal perforation now the second cause of the esophageal perforation is the Borhaab syndrome that you have also studied in your special pathology in fourth year that is also called as the spontaneous esophageal perforation so what happens in this you all know that in this what happens that the patient he vomits against the closed glottis so what happens that there would be a pressure development intra-abdominal pressure develops and it results in the perforation of esophagus so this is the Borhaab syndrome that also causes the perforation of esophagus that is called as the spontaneous perforation then we have certain penetrating injuries that results in the perforation of esophagus we also have certain perforating ulcers that can result in the esophageal perforation so these are main causes of the esophageal perforation remember this is the most common cause that is the instrumentation heterogenic we have certain other causes like the Borhaab syndrome the penetrating injury or the perforating ulcers now we are moving on towards the clinical features that how the patient will be presenting to you okay i'm writing it here how the patient will present to you now this clinical features they are based on the that where the uh, lesion where the perforation has occurred if it is for example the cervical part of the esophagus there is cervical esophageal perforation occur so how the patient will be presenting in this case the patient will obviously he will say that he has the pain in the neck neck pain and the stiffness these are the two features that uh, that will be means uh, giving you the clue that the patient is suffering from the cervical esophageal perforation now we have the second one that is the thoracic esophageal perforation if it is in the thorax so obviously you all know that in the thorax it will be causing the chest pain and along with chest pain there would be the shortness of breath shortness of breath will occur in the patient then if we have the abdominal esophageal perforation so what would be the features the patient will be complaining the pain in the epigastric region there would be epigastric pain and rigidity in that patient these are the uh, features according to the side that which part of the esophagus is uh, involved in the perforation the cervical thoracic or abdominal there are certain other features like the patient may have the hoarseness of voice hoarseness of voice may be there there may be uh, you can say desaturation of esophagus or oh, desaturation of the sorry not esophagus of the oxygen then means the patient is depri deprived of oxygen he is uh, means he is complaining of the dyspnea he is complaining of shortness of breath he may complain of the vomiting it there may be hematemesis in the patient so these are the certain other features that may also present along with these features so you have to rule out that either it is cervical uh, perforation either it is thoracic or abdominal this is very important to identify which type of perforation is there because our management plan depends upon this 
means uh, perforation this perforation type if it is cervical we will be giving the non uh, you can say operative measurements while in the thorax and abdominal we will give the operative uh, management that we will be discussing just after few minutes but i am telling you that this is important to identify which type of perforation is there that either the cervical thoracic or the abdominal now uh, after just making uh, on the clinical basis you have diagnosed the patient now what you will do you have to confirm your diagnosis for the confirmation of diagnosis we are doing the investigations in the patient so what are the investigations in that patient okay i'm removing this causes and writing it here so what uh, what are the investigations that you will be carrying out in the patient see simple is that uh, basically there are certain baseline investigations you all know CBC and CBC where there will be WBCs are uh, increased. There will be serum uh, amylase will be increased. But uh, this, this is you can say in the CBC findings first investigation. Now second the best initial investigation. We have the best initial investigation that is the chest x-ray. Chest x-ray is your best initial investigation. Best initial investigation now what you would be finding finding in the chest x-ray in the chest x-ray there would be air in the mediastinum there would be pneumothorax there would be pneumoperitoneum and also we have the pleural effusion in the patient Pleural effusion may be it may be due to the meningeal irritation. Oh, sorry, not meningeal. Uh, the pleural effusion may be due to the mediastinal irritations, inflammation of the mediastinum that will be resulting in the pleural effusion, or there may be direct contact. You see, this is your esophagus. If it is becomes perforated, and here you all know that in the thoracic cavity we have the lungs. So there is the pleura of the lungs. So if there is a direct communication between the pleura of the lungs and the esophageal perforated part of the esophagus, so that will be also developing the pleural effusion. So uh, this is the chest X-ray finding, which is the best initial investigation. Now we will also carry out the chest X-ray by giving certain contrast mediums. Like first of all, we have the water soluble contrast medium or solo you can say now this water soluble contrast solo we give that to the patient and carry out the x-ray imaging different x-ray images now first of all when this type of uh, water soluble contrast uh, solo that is the gastrographin gastrographin is the water soluble contrast uh, you can say uh, solo now when it is given it is given when there is your abdominal perforation when there is abdominal perforation we give this gastrographin now what happens that for example this is your esophagus this is cervical part thoracic part and the abdominal part now for example the esophagus is perforated from here this is the abdominal part now when you give the gastrographin to the patient it moves into the esophagus here and moving in the straight straight pathway but as it see a perforation here so this gastrographin will move here and it moves into the abdomen on the x-ray now you are you have given this water soluble contrast medium to that patient and now you are carrying out different imaging of the x-ray and in the x-ray you found that this in, in the x-ray this uh, this so you can say gastrographin will appear white in color it will appear white so this whitish area you can see it is going outside of the esophagus in the abdominal area when it is going outside it means that the perforation is present it means that the abdominal perforation is present clear now the second one is the, we are going to give the barium solo in that patient and once again we after giving barium solo we carry out the x-ray imaging now barium solo is given in the thoracic perforation of the esophagus thoracic esophageal perforation and in this also same or same happens that if this is a thoracic part of the esophagus and it is perforated here so when you give the barium solo to the patient so it moves here and you can see that here whitish area will starts to appear in the 
in this region the thoracic region and then you will diagnose it as a thoracic perforation of the esophagus now important thing here i want to tell you that why we are giving the water soluble gastrographin in the abdominal perforation and why we are giving the barium solo in the thoracic perforation means that you don't have to give the gastrographin in the thoracic perforation if for example if uh, you have mistakenly you have given the gastrographin water soluble contrast solo in the thoracic perforation so what happens that this is your ga uh, gastrographin blue one okay this is your red one i am making the thoracic one this is your barium solo uh, red one and this is your gastrographin blue one now if for example mistakenly you have given the gastrographin in the thoracic perforation and the gastrographin moves here and it moves into the thoracic cavity it moves into the thoracic cavity. obviously there would be perforation so it will be moving on to the thoracic cavity now here this gastrographin it is causing a pneumonitis it will be causing a life-threatening pneumonitis if you are giving this gastrographin mistakenly in the thoracic esophageal perforation means the gastrographin cannot enter into the thorax if it is entering into the thorax it will be causing the life-threatening pneumonitis one thing is this now second thing if you are giving mistakenly the barium uh, you can say barium uh, solution or barium you are giving in the abdominal perforation so this barium this is red one if you are giving in the abdominal perforation so barium will move here and it will move in the abdomen here now what happens in that it will obviously causing the peritonitis so that's why i here told you that it is very important to calculate that either it is cervical either it is thoracic or either it is the abdominal esophageal perforation because your investigations also depend upon this and your management also depend upon this so in investigation never give the barium solo in the abdominal perforation and the gastrographin in the thoracic perforation because the barium solo if you are given the abdominal perforation it will be causing the peritonitis and gastrographin will be causing the uh, life threatening pneumonitis clear so these are your investigation and the final investigation that is your best investigation that will be ct scan best investigation will be ct scan but the best initial investigation because you have to do it very quickly the patient uh, the patient may survive or may not survive so you have very uh, very less time to diagnose so you have to do the chest x at that time quickly and then uh, after checks x-ray means you are doing x-ray on the basis of these both clear after giving these you carry out the images and if they, there is a whiteness in there in this area or in this area you will be diagnosing it at the abdominal or the thoracic perforation these are the investigations now we are moving on towards our management that if the patient is coming to you with these uh, features so what will be the management okay one thing i have uh, forget to tell you that these are the clinical features if the patient is coming within 24 hours after the esophageal perforation clear these are the clinical feature if the patient is coming within 24 hours if the patient come after 24 hours of, of your esophageal perforation what would be the clinical features that would be unexplained pyrexia patient will be complaining unexplained pyrexia there would be systemic shock may be there in the patient you may patient may have the metabolic acidosis so these are the features if the patient is coming 24 hours after the esophageal perforation these are the features and if it is coming to before 24 hours these are the features in the patient now uh, we are moving on towards the investigations now, what are oh, sorry towards the management so in the management we have the non-operative management and the operative management now there are certain indications that when you have to do the non-operative management and when you have to give the operative management so we have the non-operative management and the operative management there are certain indications for both of these first of all for the non-operative management we have if there is a cervical esophageal perforation we will not carry out the operation the second one if uh, we have the instrumental perforation means atrogenic perforation so we will not carry out the operation third one is that if uh, you have the less contamination of the mediastinum and the pleura then there will also be we will not carry out the non uh, uh, we will uh, carry out the non-operative uh, management then 
if we have the less septic load there is less septic shock means septic shock is not present the septic load is less and if the uh, you can say the underlying pathology is also a benign pathology means this perforation is uh, presenting it presenting with the underlying benign disease then you will also carry out the non operative management in those patient now the operative management that in you have to do the operation when you have to do the operation when there is the thoracic and abdominal perforation so you have to do the operation in that patient and if there is the borehave syndrome obviously this is the spontaneous perforation and it is an emergency condition so you have to do the operation in that patient then we have there if there is a uh, greater septic load if there is a septic shock in that patient and if there is an underlying malignant disease in that patient so you will be carrying out the operative ma uh, management of this esophageal perforation now we are moving on towards that what is the non operative measurement and um, what is the non operative management and what are the operative managements so non operative managements uh, simple is that you will admit the patient in the icu then you will make the patient npo nil per oral clear then you will be giving the iv fluids to the patients you will be giving the broad spectrum antibiotics to the patient broad spectrum antibiotics to the patient then you will also give the ppis you will give the nutritional support to the patient and you can also uh, pass the endoluminal stent in that patient endoluminal stent in the patient about 6 to temporary endoluminal stent for about 6 to 12 weeks so this is simply a non operative measurement now uh, when you have to carry out the operation surgery so what you will do in this case if the patient if the patient is uh, complaining to you and he has come within 24 hours if the patient is coming within 24 hours after the perforation so what you will do you will do just a primary repair to that esophagus you will do the primary repair to the esophagus but if the patient is coming after 24 hours of the esophageal perforation means with these clinical features after 24 hours the clinical features are little bit changed these features may also be there but along with this uh, these features are also there in the patient coming with after 24 hours so after 24 hours you have to do uh, you have to do the wide bore drainage wide drainage in that patient and you have to do the feeding jejunostomy feeding jejunostomy now this wide drainage when it is done when the patient is coming after 24 hours or if uh, when there is a uh, means large uh, you can say contamination in the mediastinum and the pleura so there is the large pleural and the mediastinal contamination then you will be doing the wide drainage and the feeding jejunostomy this wide drainage is done by placing a t tube in the esophagus and then we will be doing a jejunostomy from here you will be giving the nutritional support to the patient like this is your esophagus so in this condition what happens that a t tube is placed this is a t tube this is placed for the drainage and here the drainage is there then uh, after that you will be doing the feeding jejunostomy from where you will be giving the nutritional support to the patient that the part of the jejunum is moved out and from there you are giving the feeding and nutritional support to that patient and if it is less than 24 hours and if there is less contamination of mediastinum and, and the pleura so you will be doing the primary repair of this esophagus so this is your management plan of the patient surgical management plan and the non-operative plan i have told you so this is all about the esophageal perforation where we uh, discuss about the causes we discuss about the clinical features the investigations we discussed and the operative and non-operative measurements we discussed and their indications these are the indications that i told you about the operative and the non-operative measurements so if you have any query any confusion you can ask in the comment section thank you so much allah Hafiz.